Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We got a packed evening, so thanks for coming out. Uh, for some of you who uh, know me, um, know GHI, we do a lot of online education, a lot of webinar trainings. Uh, so most of the time when I'm uh, uh, presenting and moderating, I'm you know in my pajamas, down in the basement, having a beer, having some coffee, a little bit of both. Um, and you know, staring at a computer to about talking to about 100 people. So I don't get to see everyone's faces all the time, so it's good to get out of the basement. It is a little nerve-wracking, so if I'm crying or looking afraid of all of you, because like I said, I'm staring at a computer usually, I'll go hide, uh, run off. So <laughs> um, anyway, um, I want to say a big thanks to Founders uh, Brewing, uh, who actually donated uh, this space for this event and for several others that we're going to be doing uh, throughout the course of next year. So a big thanks to them um, for doing this. And then also a uh, big thanks to uh, Michigan Agency for Energy. Um, we actually, way before my time, used to uh, work with them uh, way in the past, when I was in high school, before I even joined this uh, organization, uh, on doing uh, trainings and education. Uh, and so this will be the first time we're working with them again uh, for quite a bit of time. So I'm very thankful for their support. And Julie here is going to talk a little bit more about uh, what they do. So. Awesome. Thanks, Brett. I'm Julie Staveland. I'm with the Michigan Energy Office, and we're under the Michigan Agency for Energy. Uh, thanks, Brett, for letting us come and grab a couple minutes of your time. I'm going to keep it short. I just wanted to let you guys know about a couple of the programs that we offer in our office. One of them is the Community Energy Management, where we work with communities and school districts providing them funding to meet them on the energy spectrum wherever they're at in energy management, whether it's beginning with audits all the way through implementing and like switching out LED light or switching to LED lights. Um, we also sponsor the uh, 2030 districts in Detroit and Grand Rapids, helping them meet their 50% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030. Um, we also have a codes uh, compliance collaborative that we're working on, trying to find the gaps uh, with the Michigan uh, commercial codes and see how um, we can improve the energy in those codes. Um, we also have the sponsorship um, that we offer for different events like this one that we're doing here tonight, uh, providing funding for um, events, meetings, trainings um, that have an energy related component in them. And then we're also offering building operators certification of uh, training for building operators, either whether they're new or need refreshers um, throughout the next coming year. Um, we're also accepting ideas for our next kind of grant funding cycle for 2020. So if you have any ideas or suggestions or you want to learn about some of our other programs, we've got some cards on the table over there and then I've got some more in the back. So please feel free to stop by afterward and we'd be happy to talk to you about more of our programs and we're happy to sponsor this event. So thanks. All right. So those of you who don't know who we are, uh, uh, this is the uh, Green Home Institute who's putting this on. We're a nonprofit. We're local to Grand Rapids. Uh, we've been headquartered here since 2000, um, so we're going on almost 20 years now. Um, and my name's Brett Little. I'm the executive director here um, at the Green Home Institute. Um, this particular course here, uh, for those of you who are interested, make sure you sign in and check it off if you want Con Ed. Uh, it's approved for several different uh, types of uh, certifications, uh, AIBD, uh, BPI, Certified Green Professional, GBCI as well. Uh, and it's also Michigan Realtor approved as of today. Um, and then also those of you who need AIA, it's American Institute of Architects Health, Welfare, and Safety, uh, which may make it applicable or should make it applicable to your uh, builder's license or designer license uh, within the state of Michigan. Um, so lessons learned, uh, we're just going to be talking about uh, how, why, and practical approaches to electrifying uh, homes, multifamily, and other types of uh, buildings. So what does going all electric mean? What does it mean when we say, you know, let's electrify everything, um, let's get more electrification into our buildings? You know, what are we saying? Uh, what aren't we saying? What are we talking about? And what do we want to achieve? And so for the most part, uh, we're talking about space heating. Uh, water heating, which is our biggest uh, barriers um, 
for doing this. Uh, and we're also talking about cooking, transitioning our cooking, which is very difficult to do. Uh, people like their gas stoves. Um, and then we, uh, in most cases, we're not necessarily talking about fireplaces, indoor fireplaces. Uh, there are some cool LED fireplaces that are coming out uh, that look almost real. Uh, but for the most part, um, you know, those being mostly for aesthetics and not usually being for heating purposes, uh, we're not necessarily referencing uh, at this point in time. So the other thing, obviously, when we talk about building electrification is we're talking about getting rid of combustion, right? So uh, the old way and the way we still do it, but the, getting, the growing outdated way that we uh, create energy um, through burning things, through burning natural gas, propane, wood, and in the northeast, heating oil. Uh, I'm going to throw my dad under the bus here because he burns coal in his house to heat his house right now. Uh, so we're trying to work with him to shift him off of that. Uh, but uh, hey, it, it came with the house. It was not his idea. But I know I'm completely discredited now, and I should leave. Um, <laughs> But uh, that's what we're talking about here, um, getting off of combustion. And it's hard. It's hard to do. Um, so, you know, why is, why is combustion concerning? Um, you know, if you're talking about going all electric, you're talking about uh, line loss, right? So the biggest pushback is uh, that loss of efficiency when the electricity is coming from the coal plant, the natural gas plant, even from the nice wind turbines that we have dotted throughout our great state. We lose a lot of energy and power uh, through that line loss. So that's always one of the biggest pushbacks. Uh, but the reality is, um, from extraction all the way into your house or commercial business, maybe right now, gas is leaking everywhere. And that's money being leaked out. That's energy being leaked out. Uh, and that also could be um, a pot potential health or safety risk uh, as well. And so there are concerns of that. So the Environmental Defense Fund went around with a little Google car placed with a gas sniffer on it around major cities and was detecting all of these leaks everywhere and kind of showcasing, hey, there are these uh, uh, gas leaks going on and it could be costing you know, money. And also it puts off methane in the air, which is uh, four times more potent greenhouse gas than uh, carbon, di carbon dioxide. So uh, uh, we're going to be handing out some gift cards tonight. Uh, to those of you who can guess some trivia stuff. So you saw Boston on that map earlier, but in the context of what I'm talking about, what happened in Boston? Anybody? What's that? Houses blew up. Houses blew up. Right, yeah. So give the, give the man a card, Dan. This is our board member, Daniel Morrison, handing out, handing out gift cards. So there you go. First one down. Right, so yeah, uh, I think the number was 50,000 people Lo not just lost, lost, uh, lost gas, right? In September, um, I think that was like the final total number. Um, Twelve people died. Unfortunately, uh, businesses were shut down. Uh, small businesses, I heard, were lost. Uh, just um, while we were enjoying our Thanksgiving dinners, um, there were, uh, as a result of that, 1,500 people. Uh, in these gas explosions who still didn't have heat, still didn't have hot water. Now, this is an extreme case, but that's a lot of people uh, to have been, uh, have their home's property damaged through a mistake of, you know, the wrong type of gas being sent down a pipeline. Um, now, this is something that just popped up on my feed, and obviously there are recalls all the time for all sorts of things, uh, but this is a lot of gas water heaters uh, natural gas water heaters that were recalled for potential fire issues. Um, so something that, you know, just very concerning. Um, the other thing that we have to worry about is carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, which can be deadly. Uh, now, obviously, that's very rare. But there's also the low-level carbon monoxide um, that comes from uh, burning, um, you know, uh, natural gas and propane. And that can have effects such as flu-like symptoms, reducing uh, the ability to, f um, you know, think, uh, having impacts on the health of young children uh, and the elderly. Uh, so that can be concerning. And then I remember back three years ago when we had the big snow issues here, a lot of damage chimneys, a lot of flashing damage on those chimneys. What, why do we have those chimneys? We're, we're using it to vent uh, naturally drafting uh, water heaters or furnaces. And so those chimneys that were being used for these gas appliances uh, you know, causing durability failures, moisture issues, mold and rot, and also energy waste. Um, and then also just standard venting 
in, in new construction even uh, has a cost to it. You have to pay for that venting. Uh, and then also it can be a potential heat loss or a potential for pest entry as well. So, you know, when we're doing, when we have combustion, we've got to get uh, the, the um, you know, the, 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 the leftover from burning it out of our homes and out of our buildings. And so these are some of the downsides. The other thing uh, I want you to look at are heat load calculations, right? This is a lot. If you ever look at these things, there's a lot of information on here that you probably don't need. Um, but if you zoom in a little bit, um, you know, you can see that uh, we have uh, demand loads that are um, shrinking and shrinking, uh, even in our climate, as people build greener and as codes get tighter. So this is kind of a subjective question, but I just want to throw out there, you know, what is your standard BTU or um, MBH for of your just standard, maybe single stage gas furnace? Like how low can your conventional ones get? Who said that? 45? Uh, 45 is one. Has anyone seen anything any lower? We have a demand that's about 30. What's that? Demand that's about 30. 30? Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, we'll take that one. So <laughs> give Sean one. <laughs> All right. Um, I've seen some. Uh, I've seen some down. You know, down to uh, uh, 24, 22 now. Um, but the reality is, our buildings are getting tighter and tighter. And so this is an example of a load that we saw on a building. Uh, we're, and this is a renovation of a multifamily building uh, down to about 11. Um, and so, you know, uh, you want to make sure you have a properly sized heating system. You actually want it running all the time as much, you know, as you can rather than turning off, firing up, turning off, firing up. And so these na standard natural gas systems are getting... Uh, you know, they're just oversized for our more energy efficient homes and buildings. And Sean, who answered that question, uh, knows about some cool stuff that actually can get lower if you still want gas. So make sure to talk to him over there, Sean Wright. Uh, there are some opportunities and other solutions out there. Um, and speaking of that, so that's innovation. So where has innovation left us? Um, efficiency's kind of tapped out, right? 98% really can't get any more energy efficient than that. Um, as I mentioned, if we can get lower MBHs or BTU loads for a more affordable price without doing modulating, uh, that would be helpful. We could probably you know, see some more innovation there. Um, and then what's really coming up with the innovation in natural gas appliances is kind of like your uh, Chevy Volt, right? Your dual fuel car, your dual fuel systems. Um, so being paired with heat pumps so that the heat pumps can operate uh, when it gets a lot colder um, the natural gas furnace kicks in, and that's kind of that next level of what we're seeing, and that's, you know, introducing more electricity and more electrification into the heating of buildings. Um, so the other issue is if you want to have a net zero property, uh, zero carbon, net zero carbon, call it what you will, um, I would argue that it's difficult to do that if you're still using combustion. Um, and the reason that is, is because while on the energy modeling side, on a one-for-one -one basis, you certainly can use renewable energy uh, to uh, offset the emissions that uh, natural gas appliances or propane appliances created. Um, so you can, you know, from an energy standpoint, but from an emission standpoint, uh, no matter how much renewable energy we pile on, uh, there's still going to be emissions from our natural gas appliances that the renewable energy is not taking away. Um, so that can be, um, you know, a bit of a concern uh, for natural gas as well. All right, so for another gift card, who can name uh, somebody famous that's involved in this very old movement uh, that's no longer happening right now? Uh, better living, basically, um, you know, living better electrically, going all electric. Anybody know? Elon Musk. No, way before that. Al Gore. Al Gore. What's that? All right. Well, we'll give it to Dave. He's one of our board members. We'll give it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Well, okay. How about this? Who can name? So it's Reagan, but who can name the company behind it? What's that? GE. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So GE, Ronald Reagan. Um, and, and this was way back, way back in the day before he was president, this idea that we can live better all electric. And I think it worked out pretty well in the Pacific Northwest and California. 
uh, but really did not make it through um, to the cold weather climate states. And that's just because they were ahead of their time. We weren't there yet, but I think we're there now, and I think we can do it, and I think we can live better electrically uh, and, and do one good for the Gipper. Um, so here we are, uh, innovation. Innovation uh, is happening really fast in the uh, automobile sector. We always, in the building community, think if we could only innovate like they do uh, with automobiles, because they innovate fast. And so we've got all electric cars, we've got the Tesla, um, Daniel Morrison here, one of our board members, drives one of these, so if you want to talk to him about it, he'll tell you all about it. Um, they're getting more affordable, um, huge numbers. Um, I think this was uh, fourth quarter, they s number four luxury car um, on the market uh, within 2018. And so, um, you know, the, the, the automobile industry is electrifying, and it's electrifying really fast. And I think that uh, the building industry is going to be following suit. So you can see kind of those yellow tabs down there. This is the Energy Information Administration, EIA. They put out a five-year data on all sorts of energy use you could think of for buildings. They put out a five-year or so residential cycle. Um, and you can see here in the US, homes that are all electrically heated, uh, just trending up from 93 to 2015. Um, to I think I thought the last number I saw was nearly 34 percent. Now obviously you can see that's happening more so in the south, no surprise there, but even in the Midwest where we are, you can see it's happening that we are electrifying faster already. Uh, obviously in places like California this is really easy, makes a lot of sense there as I mentioned, but massive track home builders committing to large communities that are fully electric and gas free uh, is, a, is a sign of, of the direction that we're headed. Um, if you've ever heard of the Rocky Mountain Institute, they put out fantastic reports and data, uh, and I love everything they're doing, and they're just putting out more and more information and more and more thought. And so they put out this, this report that you can download and kind of read through right now, and it covers four different major cities in different parts of the country. So the one I want to focus on is Chicago, just because it's our closest region and it's the most relevant to us. But what you can see is a 15-year net present value, new construction. If you do a standard heat pump system and water heating, uh, you're looking at maybe a $10,000 cost to operate in your standard co to code new home. If you're doing, still doing natural gas with AC, you're looking at nearly $14,000 operation costs. Now on the retrofit side, uh, it's obviously a wash. It's dead even there. Uh, so a little more difficult to justify it, but definitely on the new side, um, you're looking at way less operation costs for uh, heat pump systems. Um, now, where it gets tricky here is the carbon emission side. So right now the heat pumps, as you can see at the top there in the green, are having higher emissions. Uh, and that's partially because our grid around these areas has a lot more coal on it. But our grids are cleaning up really fast. We're converting more to natural gas, more to renewables. And actually, if you look at their report, these numbers are reversed in every other part of the country that they had shown. Um, but right now, if you were to do this, you would honestly be adding more emissions um, in the short term until our grid continues to clean up, um, according to their report. All right, so who's doing this? So this is, uh, this is Michael Clement. He's a great guy. He's one of our uh, members from Architectural Resources. And they're having a huge tour on the other side of the state. And unfortunately, it's sold out. Uh, but the Visible Green Home Tour occurs quite a bit, so you can check that out. Um, but they got featured in them live for this super tight passive house project that they're building. And just for a gift card, does anybody want to guess? Just take a guess. What kind of uh, HVAC system do you think they're using? Radiant. Radiant. What's that? Mini splits? There it is. Jake. Jake knows, so give the man one. Right. So they are using ductless mini splits from Mitsubishi um, to heat and cool this house completely duct free. Uh, and the other thing to know about Passive House is it's super energy efficient. So I really want to stress that to do this building electrification, we are talking about making our homes and buildings as efficient as possible before we do that so it can work in our cold weather climate state. Um, this is Habitat for Humanity, Grand Traverse. They've got 10 all-electric homes up north. It's a community up there. Lead Platinum, zero energy homes up there. They've got two mini splits, one up, one down. Tom Phillips is here. Raise your hand, Tom. He can tell you 
about what they did. But there was some trouble at the beginning with Comfort, I believe, um, but they got that worked out, uh, all electric homes. Um, this is Evan Matheson, Matheson, Matheson Architects. Uh, is anyone here from there today? Uh, all right, yeah, so uh, he's one of, one of our members. Great to have you. This is his personal residence, Deer Haven, uh, all electric home with geothermal wells. And you can see, yes, there's a chimney there, but that's for an aesthetically pleasing biofuel uh, fireplace. So not for heating, but for, for looks. Um, this is in cold weather climate zone six up in Minneapolis, Roseville. Uh, this is a super tight home. That's a, uh, uh, it's a, I call it a power plant, 20 kW of solar. These people uh, are living so electric that their leaf blower, their lawnmower, uh, everything is electric. They drive two Teslas and they power everything 100% uh, with the solar right on their house, even their driving habits, 100%. And they're still making bank $4,000 a year after doing all of that, getting paid back to them. Different rules in Minnesota for the utilities. Uh, this is Sam Pope's Ecometrics, all electric home right in Lowell, uh, geothermal wells, uh, uh, standard electric resistant hot water heater, electric stove, um, near passive house certification standard, lead platinum home. Uh, this is the Purcell residence down in Fenville. Uh, Eric Hughes right here, one of our members, he's the designer. Jake back there from our value uh, builder. Um, first Green Star Platinum certified home, zero energy home. And it's fully all electric, uh, induction stove, heat pump water heaters. And they've got a um, HVAC system called uh, Chiltrex. It's kind of a new system on the market, um, but it's got really high, almost near geothermal efficiencies, but it's a heat pump uh, system to heat and cool the entire house. And we'll be releasing a video of this house, doing a tour of it uh, coming up here real soon. Um, so you probably thought about uh, new homes. Okay, that's easy to do. Um, existing homes are happening as well. This is Matt Grokoff in Ann Arbor, happyhome.how. This is a 120-year home maybe by now, a historic home that's all electric. You can see his Chevy Volt Park there. I think he just upgraded to a Tesla. And uh, they've got geothermal wells. He's the one who taught me about induction back in 2011. Never heard of it until then. Um, this is Matthew Hollander uh, winning an award uh, for a 15% energy reduction in Matea Court affordable housing 100 unit single, f uh, single family attached apartment complex. Uh, I believe this is an all electric development with uh, ductless mini splits in it uh, and uh, heat pump or uh, regular electric water heaters. Uh, this is again back, is in, back up in Minneapolis, right downtown Minneapolis. This is a lead platinum gut rehab with an addition on it. And we filmed this whole thing as well. We have it up on our website. And they actually, this is a really tight urban lot where they sunk uh, 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 geothermal wells uh, right in the back there. Um, and so really tight lot, but uh, you know, they were able to, able to do it right in the urban area. That was a geo comfort system uh, on that house. Um, and I think Catalyst, you guys are, do you have any gas? No. Catalyst Partners, uh, um, Eric over there. Uh, uh, this is a co small commercial building, geothermal, um, electric water heating through the assist, right? Uh, you have induction or just standard electric? No cooking. Yeah, no cooking, that helps. Um, but right there in Grand Rapids, as you can tell, it's happening with commercial buildings uh, as well. And so uh, Nate couldn't be here today. I really wish he could have been, but we're going to be giving out two of his books in a raffle that will be mailed later on. Um, but one of the reasons that Nate Adams actually couldn't make it here today, he's one of the all-electric gurus that I've learned a lot from, is that uh, he, uh, he's out there in the field, right? He's out there in homes, small businesses, and he's shutting off gas meters left and right. Now, his goal isn't to shut off gas meters. His goal is to help people solve their problems, be more comfortable, be healthy, and reduce their bills. But as he does that, he finds that it doesn't make any sense for them to use gas anymore. And so he's out there day in and day out um, helping people out, and it's, and it's working. So um, real quick, before I hand it off to our speakers, I want to get Michigan Saves Patrick up here um, and just talk a little bit about um, some financial resources that exist um, for these types of, uh, types of buildings. Thank you, Brett. Uh, Michigan Saves, just to let everybody know, is a, I, how many people are familiar with Michigan Saves? 
Oh, wow, that's a great outcome. Uh, contractors mainly that are familiar with it overall? Uh, we, so it's a program, nonprofit through the state of Michigan that is available for residential, com uh, commercial, municipalities, public sector. Uh, our, our flagship was the HELP program or the Home Energy Loan Program for residential. Uh, we then have also added these other uh, projects. We recently just added IPC Capital, which is going to give us some longer terms for multifamily and other commercial projects, uh, larger scale projects. Um, and here we go. I'm just going to move forward here. This is our contact slide. But essentially, we, in, in, I don't know how many in here are commercial contractors and or residential. So commercial, a couple third or so, and residential, so a larger number. Uh, our, our residential program runs through, we have a loan center that operates 24 hours a day. Customers uh, use an authorized contractor in our program. We have six uh, residential lenders throughout the state of Michigan. We have a great one right here in Grand Rapids, which is Lake Michigan Credit Union. Um, but we have statewide coverage. Uh, rates on the commercial end are as low as 5.5% currently statewide, up to 10 or 12 years, depending on a FICO qualification. Uh, on the commercial, we're looking at, they start about 7% or a little over 7%. Um, terms from um, 24 months on the commercial, and we've pushed some of the new ones with this new lender out almost to 20 years. So uh, work very closely with DTE and consumers, uh, but it's for energy efficiency or renewable energy improvements. So I think anything that basically is eligible for a rebate through those either utilities or we have uh, our, our northern Michigan utilities would qualify for financing in our program. Uh, it's a quick and easy process. Usually we can do a 10 minute approval on the residential end and two to three hours on the commercial side can get you pretty much what you need. Uh, you do need to be an authorized contractor. If you're not an authorized contractor in our program, be happy to help you do that. I'm over on the west side at least once a week, uh, based in Lansing. Uh, but we have other contacts on the east side of the state as well. So um, any questions, I'll be sticking around throughout the night. I don't want to take too much time away from the program. And you can add to new homes, right? Uh, we, can, we can do it for new homes. It, it gets a little bit tricky. Uh, for we need we have a debt to income requirement so if you have a construction draw that's already in place we just would need to run that through the process uh, but yes it could potentially be eligible for that yeah we had a project team that wanted to add solar and geothermal and um, just with the way the mortgage worked out uh, they just couldn't get enough power and power to get there but they grabbed a Michigan saved loan and they were able to add it to it so uh, very helpful <laughs> Any other questions, though, please feel free to reach me. I've got some cards. I left some flyers on the residential program on each of uh, your tables. Uh, and, and like I said, please don't hesitate. I can always stop by or I'm available by phone just by any time you could need me. Great, thanks. Thank you, Brett. You want to come up solo? How are you doing tonight? Everybody good? All right, my name is Solo Brooks. I'm the account manager for the Consumers Energy New Home Construction Rebate Program. Uh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> um, um, Brett invited me up to give this a little bit of information, an overview of how the program works. Um, so we'll get into it. Do you, oh, do you still have the slide there? Oh, okay. All right, yeah. Well, just bear with me. I did just get over a cold, so gave my voice back recently. <clears throat> so you can go to the the next one. So uh, the energy, the our rebates currently require the home to be. We do a whole home certification. Uh, it is not on the individual measures. Uh, we are giving up to seventeen hundred dollars per rebate, and that varies based on energy service, as well as uh, your HERS score. You can go to the next. <clears throat> um, so as a builder, what we need from you is very basic. We don't need a whole lot. 
Um, we need a participation agreement and a W-9, and that is to ensure that we can issue payment. Uh, you will need to get with a Energy Star certified HERS rater and HVAC contractor. Uh, from there, you will move on to your whole home certification. Then we will go into that wonderful paperwork that you guys love so much. Um, and as account manager, I, I am available to help with the paperwork. Um, I know sometimes you're in the field, you don't have time to chase down the proper her certificate or fuel summary that we need to complete your paperwork. Um, so <clears throat> up here, if you do have any questions, like I said, it's very, very brief. If you have any questions, uh, I will be here until the end of the night. And as well, you can contact us here. Just take a snapshot of that picture. My program manager is Anthony Bauer. And I'm Solo Brooks. Thanks, Al. Yes. <laughs> And I do know on the uh, commercial industrial scale side, um, for consumers energy especially, um, if you're doing a LEED certification type of building, um, there are just peer rate rebates based on your energy modeling of where the building is at uh, normally and there and where it'll be when you improve it. And it's actually based on the savings. So if you're shifting your fuel source uh, all the way to electricity, uh, then all of those rebates um, uh, are going to be right through consumers and you know you wouldn't be messing around with DT and it's just based on the energy savings uh, basically so um, there, there's more information about that on, on the uh, website there for them too. So here's our speakers lined up for tonight. I'm going to hand it off to uh, them and um, so we're going to first get started with uh, Mike Schaefer with uh, Mitsubishi so come on up. Thank you, Brett. Everyone hear me okay? All right. Good job, everybody, before me. Uh, thank you, Brett. Thank you for everyone to, for coming here. Sorry, it's hard to see. You got to look all the way up in here. You can look there, too. I'm going to look here. That's what I'm going to do. Otherwise, I'm floating all over the place. Uh, my name is Mike Schaefer. I'm the performance instruction manager for Mitsubishi for the, our central business unit, which is the Midwest. So I live in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. So I drove over this way today, and I cover 12 states here in the Midwest from the Dakotas pretty much over to Ohio, West Virginia. So my main focus is new construction, as well as renovations, rehabs, just really looking at it from a residential as well as a multifamily aspect. Uh, also here from Mitsubishi is this handsome gentleman over in the corner, Mr. Ryan Spangler, and he's the area sales manager here for Western Michigan. So he's actually the local contact for you as well. Uh, Brett did a really good job of laying out electrification and everything that we're here to talk about tonight. I had a lot of slides based on electrification. I'm glad I took them out because it would have been just very redundant for what he said. But our, my main goal is from a new construction or renovation standpoint is to utilize electric forms of heating in these homes or in these multifamily units. If they have gas, it's also looking to potentially just displace that energy as well. Maybe not eliminate gas because I work in a lot of colder climates, colder than here. When you get up northern Minnesota and Dakotas where gas is still pretty much essential for that that, okay, maybe we can just displace some of that energy usage as well from the gas standpoint. But whether it's through air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps or air to water like the Chiltrek system, just some way of getting that home electrif electrified. That's my, main, that's my main purpose. So what we're gonna talk about real briefly, because I only have 15 minutes and I'm the one that's gonna keep us on track for not going over this entire night now, is mainly talking about technology, efficiency, cold weather capability, some design and application of air source heat pumps. Giving you kind of a broad overview of what they are. There's a lot of folders on the tables out here. I had no idea, especially when I agreed to pay for the first beer for everybody, the amount of people that we were gonna have here. <laughs> because this is way more than what I expected, but it's fantastic to see a, a room full of crazy people like me here that wanna try to electrify things. But um, there are folders on the tables. If you need more information, please let Ryan or I know. We can get you more cash catalogs and more folders as well too. Um, first off, kind of the lifeblood of an air source heat pump or for Mitsubishi in particular is our inverter compressor. If anyone's familiar with a traditional compressor, that's when we're talking about a traditional unitary type air conditioner or heat pump, usually is a single stage type compressor, kind of an on off system. 
how that works is when the system turns on, that compressor pretty much ramps up to about 60 hertz, takes a little bit of time to drop that temperature, usually a couple degrees below set point, if you look at it from a cooling, if we're looking at it from a cooling standpoint, drop the temperature about a couple degrees below set point, and then what does it do? It kicks off. That's pretty much standard, right? And then when does it kick back on again? When you get a couple degrees above set point and you're starting to get uncomfortable, that system kicks back on again. And then what does it do? Satisfies the temperature, kicks back off. It's that on and off function of how it actually works. So if you're used in your house, if you live in an older house or have a traditional system, you see dimming of lights when the air conditioner kicks on. That's that compressor banging on and banging off all the time. High energy use, very uncomfortable in terms of temperature swings in the home, but that's kind of what we're used to a lot of times, so people don't think it's that odd. But there's a better way to do it. An inverter compressor is the way to do it. So all of Mitsubishi systems and air source heat pumps in general have inverter compressor systems in them. So if we think of an inverter compressor, it's more like a modulating or a variable speed type system if you're used to it. So how our compressor kicks on is it starts a very slow start, a soft start. It doesn't bang on like a traditional system. And then it ramps up very fast. So high rotation speed is gonna drop that temperature very quickly to set point, and then we're just gonna maintain. And that's all we're gonna do. We're gonna drop down and run around 30 hertz, and we're just going to maintain. So we're gonna keep that temperature consistent in the space. We're not banging on, we're not banging off. It's like when you pump your gas, you get on the on-ramp, or the off on-ramp, and then you get on the highway and you just hit the cruise control button. And then we're just maintaining. So that's how the inverter compressor works. A lot more comfortable in terms of temperature in the home, a lot more energy efficient. When we think of air source heat pumps or a Mitsubishi system, we generally think of ductless, which is the wall mount unit. So if you're used to hearing like a mini split or a ductless system, that's the type of system that we think of is that wall mount unit. As we can see here, there are a multitude of different options. We have single zone systems, single zone systems meaning that there is one air source heat pump sitting outside that is connected then to one of these indoor units inside as well. So that's a single zone system. Then we also have multi-zone systems where we have one outdoor heat pump connected to a multitude of indoor units. From two up to eight, you get into commercial up to 50, so a lot more when you get to that. So we have wall mount units, floor mount units. We have units that we can put ductwork on. You know, we say ductless, but I'm not anti-ductwork. We have indoor units that you can utilize ductwork with as well. I'm pro-ductwork as long as we keep it controlled, sealed, and tight. We have ceiling recessed. We have a couple new units, like our multi-position air handler. So if you have a home that's being built and they say, I don't wanna see any of this stuff in my ceiling, on my wall, on my floor, I just don't wanna do that, I want a traditional system, we have multi-position air handlers that are literally installed just like a traditional furnace is or a traditional air handler. It's utilizing that inverter system. It's utilizing hyperheat cold climate technology, which we'll talk about, but it's gonna look just like a traditional system and it's gonna be ducted just like a traditional system. We also have our newest unit, which is a one-way ceiling cassette. The beauty of this unit is that it's built to fit right in on 16 on center joist spacing. So you don't have to have any, any form of special access panel. You don't have to do any kind of framing in your joist to get a ductless system in. So this gives you the option of going, I wanna eliminate duct work, I don't wanna use it, but I don't wanna put anything on the wall. So I'm gonna use a system that I can retrofit very easily or in a new construction aspect, put in without a lot of other framing work. All of these indoor units combine into what we call is zone comfort solutions, and that's really precise temperature control, precise energy efficiency, giving you the exact temperature and control in each space in your home that you want. So I talked about our hyperheating, I mentioned our hyperheating technology. This is our cold climate heat pump technology. So why have traditional heat pumps not been used as a primary form of heating in colder climates? They, they can't do it, right? They just, they can't do it. So a traditional heat pump, like this standard on the chart here, we have those as well that we utilize in warmer climates where people really want cooling and may have a little bit of heating. 
a standard heat pump, once you hit that 40 degree temperature or so, your capacity just dives off. It can't be a primary source of heat in a cold climate. With our hyperheating technology, that has changed things drastically. So how our hyperheating technology works is there's a lot of stuff going on in the compressor that we can talk about later and, and do things offline. We don't have time for that. But it maintains higher heating performance to much colder temperatures, as you can see. Our, our hyperheat technology maintains 100% heating capacity all the way down to 5 degrees. So at 5 degrees, you're getting out of that air source heat pump what you're getting out of it at 47 degrees. And then at 5 degrees, that's where we start to derate. But as you can see from this chart, it's a much slower derate. We have systems that are maintaining 93% capacity still at minus 13 degrees outside. And that's air temperature. That's, not, that's ambient temperature. That's not wind chill. Wind chill doesn't matter for us. So think about how often you are minus 13 degrees here, air temperature, not wind chill. Not, not very often, right? So question, what happens below minus 13 degrees? Does anyone know? If you need it. So our systems don't turn off at minus 13. That's just where for AHRI purposes we rate them at. So they continue to operate and that chart just keeps going. On, on, a, on the same scale that it's going on. So our systems don't stop operating at minus 13. If you are in a much colder climate, like a Minnesota or other areas where you do have a lot harsher temperatures, then maybe some backup heat is required if you look at that. So let's look at Grand Rapids because that's where we are. So we want to focus on what is our actual bin data heating hours here in Grand Rapids. I said, I'm from Chicago. It's a lot colder. I let, you think it's cold here today. It was like 8 degrees when I left this morning to drive over here. So it was a lot colder over there than it is here. And I have a lot of new construction as well as renovation projects in Chicago that there is no backup heat in at all. And we've had, and that's been years now with, with no problems on that. But if we look at Grand Rapids in general, this line right on this chart here is that 5 degree line. Remember, we operate just fine below five degrees, but this is where we're 100% capacity. This little lip right here is the amount of time we're actually below five degrees here in Grand Rapids. It's not very much. I dug a little bit deeper. This is a 20 year weather history from 96 to 2016. There are some websites you can grab this off of and grab it for anywhere if you wanted to know. But this shows the total bin data heating hours and cooling hours for Grand Rapids. This is the below five degrees area. It's 122 hours on average every year we're below five degrees here in Grand Rapids, which equals, equates to about five days, that we're actually below that 100% heating capacity time. Can we handle it below five degrees? Absolutely we can, as long as we size things appropriately. But a lot of times in cold climates, we get that mindset of it's just too cold for an air source heat pump. Traditionally, it absolutely is. But with newer technology and ways of size and thing design, it can absolutely work. So that's just Grand Rapids in general. I want to show a little bit here on energy. Sorry, that founders thing was supposed to be on the previous one, which you get the founders one because you answered the minus 13 <laughs> for sure. Sorry, that thing was supposed to be on the previous slide. That's okay. You got it. Um, I want to talk about some energy efficiency here because we have a lot of people here from the utility side. Um, we, our utilities manager ran some scenarios here looking at AHRI data of what kind of, what products and what are their energy efficiencies out there. He used the 16 SEER 9 HSPF as a baseline. So in the AHRI directory, there's over 387,000 active heat pumps. That's your traditional unitary heat pumps active in the AHRI directory. So like a carrier or a Lennox, those type of traditional systems. Out of those, only 13% actually meet that baseline that we consider to be above that high efficiency. We looked at variable speed ductless heat pumps. There's a lot less. There's only 6,000 of them listed in the AHRI directory, but 79% of those meet that, that high efficiency threshold there. If we look at the Mitsubishi equipment a little bit more in depth, this is our total product line here. Almost all of our products meet that 16 SEER 9.8 HSPF. If we look here, we have systems above 30 SEER. We have systems that are 33.1 SEER. 31 SEER, 30 SEER. So we have very, very energy efficient products with high HSPFs as well, with higher COPs. So we're not just efficient on the cooling, we're efficient on the heating as well too, because that's a very big misconception of electric heat, right? Think electric heat, you think electric resistance heat, which is 100% efficient, but costs an arm and a leg to run. So we're a lot more efficient than electric resistance heat. 
for the sake of time, I'm not going to dig into this. But Kevin, our utilities manager, put this together too. He used um, 10 cent, 10.53 cents of a kilowatt hour, looked at all these different efficiencies utilizing cost per million BTUs. We're the red, we're COPs. As you know, air source heat pumps, since we run off of the air, we're pulling heat out of the air. The colder it gets, our COP does go down from that aspect because it's an air source heat pump, but we run on average between two and five. It isn't until about five degrees that natural gas starts to become more efficient in terms of cost per million BTUs. And remember how many hours here are we below five degrees? 122, everyone gets a beer. Everyone got a beer already. Uh, 122 hours, so only five days of the year does that actually equate to natural gas being more efficient than our, than our hyperheat heat pump at that time. Um, I don't know how we, are, how we are on time here, but I'm gonna burn through this. So I said my focus is new construction. What we focus on is comfort, health, and efficiency. Code compliance is driving a lot of that though. As we know now, Michigan's what, 2015 ICC code? So code is driving a lot of the things that we're out there, we're out there preaching already. As we know, as the code gets, you know, as the codes progress, it gets stricter and stricter. Brett already mentioned it, heating and cooling loads get lower and lower. Big reduction in energy usage with 2015 IACC, increased envelope tightness, additional regulations on ductwork. So we have to seal, we have to test ductwork. So going ductless saves a lot of money, saves a lot of time of testing and, and sealing ductwork. Increased ventilations and indoor air quality requirements. The housing landscape's changing, obviously, we know that. So we're a really good solution for that. Air source heat pumps are a really good solution. Whether it's ductless, whether it's all ducted with our multi-position air handler or horizontal ducted units, or whether it's a mix. I like a mix. I like a ducted ductless solution a lot. I really like that. So we can design in a multitude of ways. For the sake of time, I'm just gonna focus on a couple things here. These are just some pictures. There's a floor mounted unit, there's a wall mounted unit. Here's some instances of our horizontal ducted units installed in new construction. The key is keeping it inside the thermal envelope. That's the key with ductwork. Like I said, I'm not anti-ductwork, but let's keep, make sure we keep that ductwork inside the thermal envelope. Let's keep it tight and let's keep it sealed and clean. So this is our horizontal ducted units actually installed from soffiting. So soffiting is a way to do it. Has anyone used a plenum truss design, a modified, a modified truss design? That's where we can actually, where you can raise the truss in the plenum and put your horizontal ducted unit and ductwork right in the center, kind of building a cavity for that system and keeping it inside the thermal envelope where you don't have, now you don't have to seal off your attic, you don't have to worry about fully encapsulating that attic if you keep the ductwork out of there. Uh, compact duct design is another thing. We can talk about that offline for the sake of time as well. So how do we design right when we build so tight? There's a couple ways. I said I really like that hybrid ductless ducted design. I mean, think about how do you install an air source heat pump with a, a multi-position air handler very easily, the same way that you would install a traditional system. So how do you do it with ducted and ductless equipment? Here is just an example. There's a multitude of different ways that we can design homes whether it be new construction or retrofit. But let's take this standard ranch model and let's say we want the homeowner wants to put this into four zones. I'm gonna have a multi-zone outdoor unit and I'm gonna put a ductless indoor unit in these two bedrooms. No duct work, I'm just connecting with copper line sets to the, to the air source heat pump outside. But then I wanna zone off a couple other places in this home too, but it's too closed off to really use all ductless in there. I don't wanna put six different ductless units in this house, so let's utilize a little bit of duct work. So let's put some ductless units in these two bedrooms and then use some horizontal slim ducted units to take care of this living and kitchen area. And then I want my master on his own too, so I'm gonna put that on a very small ducted system as well. So what did I do with this house? I'm able to utilize air source heat pumps. I'm able to do ducted systems for these larger areas and for my master, and I can do ductless systems for these two smaller bedrooms, and now I have four individual comfort zones in this house. So if I want to set back this unit when I go to bed because nobody's in this room, I can. If I want to turn it off, I can as well. If I want to have a colder temperature in my master bedroom when I go to sleep at night, that's what I can do, and all saving energy and being comfortable at the same time. 
we're here, Brett talked, you know, electrification. There's all these reasons why. We're all interested in this for, for whatever reason it might be, but we know that either displacing the fossil uses of fossil fuels, going towards all electric, we know it's the way we have to go to help our climate, to help our planet. I talk about this and in some areas I'm, you're crazy, we can't do all electric heating, we can't do all electric cooking, we got these great things we'll talk about. We can't do all electric water heating. It just doesn't make sense. It costs too much money. You're nuts. You're crazy. We hear that all the time. Um, I found this quote, and this quote really, you know, I think everyone can probably relate to that. It's the ones who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do. So sometimes it takes a little bit of crazy thought to think, well, maybe I can do my heating. Maybe I can do my cooking. Maybe I can do my water heating, my clothes drying, everything all electric. We definitely can. There's a lot of things we have to keep in mind, and that's designing appropriately. That's what I can help with. That's what Ryan can help with. That's what we can do from a heating side, is if you have a retrofit, if you have a new construction, it's all about designing it appropriately. I've seen our equipment and applications that is working fine, but the design is terrible. And then it isn't working okay. <laughs> like the equipment's fine, but the homeowner's not satisfied because the design is not right. So I want to make sure with every home that I'm involved in, every multifamily that I'm involved in, that we're doing the right design because that means more than anything. So the goal obviously then is to build better. So by by in order to change the world, we have to tackle this water heating, we have to tackle the space heating, and we have to build better to do it. My contact info, as well as Ryan, please reach out to either of us if you have any questions. We're here to help. Like I said, I'm out of Chicago, but I cover the whole Midwest. Ryan's local here, so we can help with any kind of questions you might have. If you want more information, we can always meet with you at another time as well to dig a whole lot deeper into what I covered here in hopefully 15 minutes. I have no idea how, how long I went, but that's all for me. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Scott Jarrell. Um, I'm with Intertech. We manufacture geothermal. This is Courtney, who is with Midwest Geothermal. Uh, what are we going to talk about tonight? Yeah, geothermal. Um, but more importantly, big, big buzzword is net zero. So we thought we would focus in on how geothermal helps you get to net zero. And so just starting off, let's go ahead and start off with the question because otherwise I will completely forget to ask it. But on average, how much of the home's energy is used to condition the space and the water? Any guesses? 50%, anyone else? Yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna go with 70%. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. So, Brett, uh, reward this young man over here. Um, but really, what, where we land, and it is an average, so I think you're right there, is basically 65%. So 65% of a home's energy goes into conditioning that space and the water it uses, so or the hot water. So with that being said, one of the first things, and this may surprise you because we're in the HVAC industry, but the first step in getting there is tightening that envelope. Because no matter whether you're using geothermal or air source heat pump, you're tightening that so you use less energy or you're losing less energy through that envelope. And then next, you want to look at that home's energy usage and start with that big bite of 65%. So we're gonna tackle that and we're gonna explain where geothermal uh, fits into that. And then of course, again, we're not here to talk about solar or, or solar batteries, but then you would follow that up after you've tightened that up so you're not losing energy and you're operating it as efficiently as you can inside, then you look at, okay, how can I offset the rest of the cost of running that home by producing my own power? And that comes with your solar panels and or batteries as a last step. So a geothermal unit, a geothermal unit, basically a good way to explain that 
is that it gives you, for every unit of electricity that you use in a home, it's going to give you four to five units of, of energy in return. So that is why it brings it down your load so much in that home. So they're about 400% to 500% efficient uh, compared to conventional equipment. And again, I don't want to slight anything in the air source. They've come a long way. A geothermal is still going to be that much better. So how does it work? What are we, how does a geothermal work? Well, it may, uh, the slide's not showing completely here. All right. Let me see here. Sorry. Yeah, that threw me off a little bit. There we go. Sorry about that, guys. But we're going to talk about solar. I don't know how many of you have ever thought of, of geothermal as a solar system. Not the solar system, but a solar system. Because that's exactly what it is. What we're doing is we're taking our energy grid, if you will, the loop, and we're burying that down into the solar battery. The sun gives off its, its energy and it's absorbed. 51% of that is absorbed into the earth. So that is our renewable source of energy. So we'll take that in the summertime and we will go down into around here about a 48 48 to 50 degrees in this area. So in the summertime, we're going to take that 48 to 58, 48 to 50 degree temperature, and we're going to take the heat out of the home, and we're going to take it down into that cooler dirt where that heat exchange is going to take place. Or in the wintertime, now your 48 to 50 degree temperatures is going to take that, as that water transfers through the ground, is going to pick up that energy again and deliver it right back into the geothermal unit. So does that make sense to everybody? China, I'm sorry. I'm the automation here. I, I hesitate to say this, but I live in Ohio. And so me and Courtney, <laughs> IO, thank you for that. Where'd that come from, by the way? All right. There's two of us here. Uh, we'll walk out together <laughs> for safety purposes. So I'm going to turn this over to Courtney, and she's going to get into what the ground loops, what the types are, and so on and so forth. So. Awesome. Well, uh, my favorite part of tonight is how much HVAC we're talking about. Because <laughs> I go to a lot of these, and it is the least thing we talk about when we talk about electrifying a home. Because as much as I love compact fluorescent, LED lights, I don't care how many light bulbs you replace, you can't get to net zero without taking care of your space conditioning. So yay, HVAC, even though it's kind of boring to listen to for a really long time. So <laughs> I appreciate it, but I am from Michigan, based right here in Grand Rapids. But I'm going to talk about types of installations, because that is what I do. So we'll talk about slinkies first. That looks like a whole lot of pipe in the ground. But a really great place for a slinky system is under a soccer field or under playground equipment. Somewhere that we're not going to build on, but it's green space that we just don't really do anything else with. So what a great place to bury some pipe. This actually is a school in Portage. This is uh, Portage Lake Center Elementary. Um, slinkies are tough because it requires a lot of pipe. There's only over 50 miles of pipe in the ground here. But you'd never know it was there, which is also my favorite part of geo is, well, favorite and it's kind of a, a little bit of a hurdle for me as a geocontractor because once it's in the ground, no one has any idea we're there. So this is another view of that. You can kind of see us just backfilling the dirt. How deep was that? That was about eight to 10 feet deep. So when we do a slinky system, it tends to be a bigger cut. Um, yeah, at least. We need to really get below that huge temperature swing. So not just below the frost line, but really to the point where we're not going to you give me a call. I, that's all. Yeah. The deeper, the better. <laughs> so in your house, this is a more traditional home style system. This is a horizontal open trench. And all of these systems are closed loop. I'm not a huge proponent of open loop. They're a great way to get into a geo market. But do you know how much water a traditional open loop system will use? 
in a home, a million to a million and a half gallons of water a year. So if you're pumping that much water, how long, one, is your well pump going to last? But two, <laughs> that's a lot of energy. So if the point is to get net zero, we're kind of defeating the point by going to a, an open loop system. So this is just another cool picture. I had an excavator who was very nimble, got up on the roof and took a really cool picture, kind of showing that it doesn't have to be linear, that uh, we can kind of zigzag this into a backyard. But this is the most cost effective way to go with a closed loop geothermal system. So this is kind of a cool illustration so showing a vertical loop. Um, when we talk about vertical loops, it's the most popular in like a downtown setting like this. Uh, does anybody know of a project here downtown that has a vertical geo system? You do where? Catalyst? Over on the street. Yep, we did Catalyst when you guys, or we drilled your holes. Uh, actually, the downtown market also has a geo system, 63rd District Court, the Croc Center, they all have vertical geo systems. Um, but <laughs> if you visit the buildings, you don't know because you can't see it. But how cool is that? We are doing the Michigan State Capitol, 224 holes, 500 feet deep uh, on the west side of the Capitol, which is a very cool project. Um, so this is just kind of illustrating what those vertical bores look like, kind of a cross section if you were to cut it open. So this is what they look like. This is actually the Croc Center. So the Croc Center's loop field is actually located behind the building under the soccer fields. So this is a cool one. And this is, I just like pictures of drill rigs because they're cool and big and really expensive, so I like to show them off. But this is a project just south of Indianapolis. Um, the nice part about this project is it's more of a district style geothermal system. We actually ser served three triple barracks, a two single barracks and a dining hall with one loop field. So this is kind of, it's a mess. <laughs> when we install it, I will never say that it's not because it's, it's very messy, but once we get to the point, this is what it looks like when it's done. This is a recent Google Earth image. Um, but with technology today, I can actually GPS all the data. So you see, you can't see anything that goes on with the geo system. This is where all the bores are. So you can see the parking lot is just full of bores. We have a distribution system. The other X's as you go around are points for vaults. So places that we can get in and modulate flow or isolate systems if maintenance needs to happen. But in all fairness, the maintenance that happens isn't on the outside, it's on the inside. The pipe that we put in this ground has a manufacturer's warranty for 50 years. So if the manufacturer is gonna stand behind it, for 50 years, <laughs> the chances of it lasting 100, probably pretty good. So outlasting quite a lot of the buildings that we install today. So this is kind of the showing the drawing. I didn't know how, what our audience quite was, so I thought I'd show the illustration of what it was before we installed it. So this is a house, um, just kind of showing the bores and the fact that this is a beautiful landscaped lawn uh, right out in Traverse City, uh, right out on a point into Lake Michigan and how easy it is to hide your heating and cooling system. Um, their actual biggest push was they did not want to hear air sourced equipment run. They didn't want to hear an air conditioner outside. They didn't want to hear any outdoor equipment. So it's silent. They don't see it. They don't touch it. They don't hear it. This is one in Alpena. So as you can see, we kind of travel all over, but another vertical system. And this actually ends up being their driveway. So it's nice. A vertical system can go virtually anywhere. We drill through anything. <laughs> Everybody likes the big picture of the rock. That This was actually at Kalamazoo College. Um, and we had no idea we drilled through it until we went to dig it out of the ground. So it was pretty cool. And this rock actually now sits at the Blandford School here in town. So this is showing kind of the bigger scale of geothermal. This is at the University of Notre Dame. Um, we did <laughs> a very crazy project um, a couple summers ago. They had to rip up their parking lot anyway, so they decided, you know what, we've got to do all this construction, let's just put geo in right now. They actually won't touch this for a few years, but it was the investment in t later. So they're already doing construction, so when we talk about retrofitting this into a commercial building, or frankly a home, if you're already digging something up, put this underneath it, even if you don't use it today, let's size it for later. So this is another cool project. Um, that we're doing out on the West Coast, uh, uh, West Coast being California, not just <laughs> here in West Michigan. Um, but this is a cool project because we are actually installing this under the parking garage. So during construction, we are actually drilling down almost 400 feet, 700 holes, and they will build a parking garage on top of us. 
So we've got the cool, we're drilling right between the pylons. So we talk about geo and its environmental impact. As much as I love geo and I love what I do, and it does save money, but it is also incredibly environmentally friendly. So this is just a cool slide that talks about that a little bit. Sorry, I'm trying to breeze through so that we're staying on time and anybody can ask questions. So quick highlights. So these are the parts, this and then the next slides that talk about some misconceptions as to what geo can do for a building's design. So we talk about geothermal, you saw the cool pictures of dirt, which is what my geo pictures look like because we play in a lot of dirt. Um, but it's talking about what does it do for a building? So the best part is, now I don't need rooftop equipment. I don't. If it's a straight geo system, now you can change the structure of your roof. So any architects in here that like the big, cool, beautiful pitched roofs, now you don't have to worry about putting a flat spot in to put an air handler up there. All of that can go in the building. Um, so reducing the load bearing requirements as well, distribution ducts can be reduced. Because now, just like the air source system, water source systems also have small cartridge style heat pumps. Um, in addition, now boiler rooms. Spaces can be shrinked. If it's a 100% geo system, I just need a couple pumps that distribute just like a traditional boiler system would be, but now I don't need a boiler. I don't need a boiler technician. I don't need someone to go out and surface a chiller because it could just be 100% geo. Um, the last one, which is my favorite one, especially to talk here in Grand Rapids with some big, beautiful historic buildings, geo's great for being able to space condition a historic building. Because what can't we do to a historic building is change the outside envelope. So instead, if you want air conditioning in your historic church or your historic building, put it under your parking lot, put it under your green space. And now, I haven't changed anything on the outside, but I now can use that space all year round and be as comfortable as I want to be. Um, ease of maintenance, so I kind of touched on this briefly. So with a 100% geo system, it's a fairly simple system. I have pipes in the ground mm -hmm. that don't need any help, and then I have pumps in the building, heat pumps in the building, that I don't have any water treatment necessarily. It can be 100% water. I don't have a boiler technician that I have to find, and let's say something goes down on a weekend, how difficult it is to find that guy. Or a chiller that is large and not always the most beautiful thing when we're talking about some cooling towers too. So that's very nice. And then uh, extended efficiency. So when we talk about conventional equipment, they have a life expectancy. Uh, even if we say the, I mean, we've all seen old buildings with boilers that are 30, 40 years old. How efficient is that boiler? One, but two, <laughs> I don't ever have to do that. I don't have to replace anything. This loop field will be there forever. So let's talk about some misconceptions. So uh, Scott touched it on a little bit, but the ground's only 50 degrees, how can that possibly heat my house? So geo works, in all fairness, any of these heat pumps work with refrigerant. It's the magic of refrigeration, works just like your refrigerator at home. You put something warm in the refrigerator, that refrigerant coil in the back is very reactive and will absorb that heat, uh, and then it rejects it at the bottom of your refrigerator. There's cool YouTube videos you can watch. There's a lot more detail to it, but in general, it's rejecting the heat as air at the bottom of your refrigerator. This works in the exact same way, but instead of us rejecting that heat out into space like the refrigerator does, we're gonna reject it into the ground to store it for later. And then there's a little valve that reverses and says, yeah, I'm not gonna cool anymore, now I wanna heat. So now it does the opposite, where now we're going to bring warmer temperatures into the building to then heat. Completely run by electric, there's nothing renewable about it. Hopefully I don't have to super explain this in this room, but as Scott mentioned, for every unit of electricity that I bring in, a geo system will put out four or five units of heating and cooling. So this is my favorite one, because I hear it a lot. <laughs> Geothermal is so expensive, I'll never see the payback on that. Well, that's not true. <laughs> when we talk about payback, it Traditionally, most of the time when people talk about payback, they're only talking about the operational expense. We're only talking about how much is my utility bill affected. The thing we're not talking about is how much maintenance is affected, how much downtime is affected, how much replacement cost I have. So for that boiler that's 30 years old that I have to replace, now I don't need to. So it's dramatically, uh, it's, it's huge. The cost savings, when we look at more than just the utility savings, is massive. So a few more what can geo do for you. 
So unmatched comfort and reliability. When talking about residential, this is a call we get way more often than not that the geothermal system won't keep up. So my first question I ask them is, are you programming your thermostat? Well, yes, it saves me money if I turn it down when I'm not home. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> a geosystem actually is a tremendous amount more efficient if we just set it and forget it. Because when you set your thermostat and you set it down, and then you immediately say, nope, I want it to be five or seven degrees warmer, the heat pump's gonna go, holy cow, I'm not happy, that, because the thermostat's not happy, now I'm gonna have to go into second stage. Now I'm gonna have to run even harder. Maybe I have to kick on that electric resistance backup that some of these heat pumps have. It's incredibly expensive to run. So geothermal, much more efficient if you just leave it alone. Um, no combustion, so as Brett was talking earlier, our goal is to get rid of combustion. Geo doesn't have any. There are some units out there, uh, as Brett had mentioned earlier, that will be a combined unit. So it's not just geo, but the backup, instead of being electric, can be gas. Natural gas is ridiculously cheap. So to use that as a backup is a great idea for right now. Simple controls. If it's a straight geo system, I don't have to do a whole lot. There are pumps to control, and that's about it. When we talk about big commercial systems, though, we do talk about hybrid systems. Geo is the most happy when it has a balanced load. I have equal heating to equal cooling. So sometimes we can use uh, conventional equipment, if, especially if budget is a concern, to, it's gonna get a little more complicated, but in general, we can then kind of balance those loads out. Um, a multitude of delivery options. I don't care if you want forced air or if you want radiant in the floor, Geo can do both. Uh, no outdoor equipment required, so as I mentioned with that home, now you don't have to have equipment outside. I don't have to worry about, especially in the city, how many times have we heard that condensers have been stolen or that they've been robbed of their copper. Now I don't have anything outside. Um, we've actually done habitat homes this way in Lansing, and those homes only require a bore, maybe two, and we can do it right in the driveway, in the front yard, in the backyard. It's very, very compact, very, very simple. Um, lower utility operating cost. That's a given, um, as I mentioned, lower maintenance cost, um, reduced footprint requirement. So uh, unlike a solar panel, I don't need anything above the ground. So I can be very easily under a driveway. So how much easier is that that now I don't have to have a structure outside? Uh, and longer equipment life, a heat pump, even an air source heat pump has a traditional, much longer lifespan than a gas-fired furnace, especially because now we're not losing efficiency like we do in something that's combustion. Oh, sorry, I turned it off. Okay, so I kind of went through it quick. Sorry, I was trying to hurry for speed time. But any questions? size. So we get phone calls quite often that they say, oh, I have a pond. I'd like to put a geo system in. But even an average home at least needs an acre of pond, and I need it to be some fed of some kind. And it needs to be 10, 12 feet deep because I can't get it, I can't let it freeze. So there are wonderful pond systems. The boat works out in, uh, over towards the lakeshore has a great pond loop system right under their docks. It's a great way to put it in very cost effective, but most people don't have that quantity of water in a pond they own, and we can do it in public waterways too, but the permitting process is so extensive, a lot of people just don't have the time to wait for that. I mean, it's up to six months. What is the payback period for a geothermal system propane? Propane, ugh, five years-ish. I mean, especially with some of the craziness that we've had lately with the uh, cost of propane. I mean, a few years ago when we had that ridiculous winter and propane went up to three, four dollars a gallon. It, I mean, that's insane. So it is, it is fairly quick. And right now, I mean, propane's nah, not terrible. So that's what we say about five years, but traditionally we say three to five. So that's huge. So that is a huge point. 
And my biggest complaint, sorry consumers, that you don't have a prescriptive benefit for residential geo in order to get a rebate back. Uh, sorry about DTE, totally does. Um, <laughs> not to you know give you a hard time at all. But <laughs> yes, co-ops and whoever your electric supplier is, huge reduced rates. Sometimes it's even a separate meter for the heat pump and it's a dramatic difference from your traditional operating rate. Any other questions? Yes, I had a 2,600 square foot ranch, uh, and I was down by Gun Lake. So in that crazy snow belt, um, I never set, I did, never changed it from 70. What was your uh, Three. Yep, because I was a walkout ranch in the basement, so not a ton of load in the basement, but it was a three ton. Don't listen, Scott. Bosch unit, <laughs> but it worked. Phenomenally, I didn't have issue one. And to be completely fair, I saw there were a couple of realtors in the room, but the people that ended up buying my home bought it because it was geo. I didn't have a garage. <laughs> and they chose the geo system over a house with natural gas with a garage. Yeah, did you have a question or, oh, anybody else? We're gonna do Q&A at the end. Perfect. Okay, we'll, we'll skip that. So basically, what, you know, how far, right along with the whole program of the night about how far electric water heating has come from a standard, which kind of the one on the left there, even though now we have units that have Wi-Fi connectivity and leak sensing and things like that, that's what that's showing, but the standard two element electric water here in a home to a marathon electric water here, which also two elements, but much more efficient. And you start talking about lifetime warranties because it has a plastic tank. Can you go one more slide? One more, sorry, one more. <laughs> so you start looking at, at the cutaway here, the big advantage of marathons and where we've seen a big growth in these in, is larger volume, because uh, April of 2015, the National Energy Conservation Act, Appliance Conservation Act that everybody has seen, you've seen uh, refrigerators get more efficient all the way to microwave ovens, washers and dryers. Those, well, they also affected water heaters. And what the government did at that time was take away um, any water here is 55 gallons and above. So the industry's kind of figured out some ways around that. We've done it with this, with basically using uh, a light duty commercial for residential use. The big advantage with this marathon is, is like I said, it's, it's a lifetime warranty heater. Um, it's also going back to geothermal. The geothermal people use that heater all the time because it's the most efficient heat loss wise. You see how much foam there is on that, on that heater all the way around the tank. You only lose two degrees in 24 hours when it doesn't run. So if you don't use any hot water, it's essentially a thermos. It, it, it'll go a week without turning back on if you leave for vacation and things like that. So that's the big advantage of that, of that marathon heater. And also in the, in the country where people complain of uh, rotten egg odors from anode rod reacting with uh, bacteria in the water, those kinds of things, there's no anode rod in this heater either. So it's a good, good unit to use that way too where people are concerned about, about their well water and things like that. But the main, go ahead, go, go ahead, go one more. Now just play this. This is just gonna show. So we got a couple quick videos here we're trying to, this should show a marathon, I believe. We need marathon electric water Built for a lifetime okay. from the inside yeah. out. Sorry. The inner tank is it's a like polybutane mold, so it won't rust It's fine. Grow. So we're going full screen. Thank you, Brian. We marathon electric water heaters. Built for a lifetime from the inside out. The inner tank is a seamless polybutane mold, so it won't rust or grow. With two and a half inches of foam insulation, these units are exceptionally efficient. And now that REEM offers a grid enabled option, energy savings can be even higher. These lightweight but extremely durable water heaters resist dents and scratches. Plus, with a free lifetime warranty upgrade upon registration, Marathon is the last water heater homeowners will ever need. Learn more at Ream.com. And that's our thing, too. That you'll see this in the next one, too. We've done a lot more. Ream.com. Um, we also have a, a portal, MyReam.com. If you don't have a MyReam account, especially contractors, a lot of great information on there. We have a full marketing program now where you can get discounts on your trucks, 
Um, we can help you with websites and all kinds of things. Sorry, it starts up again. It's all right. And now we'll talk about really what the, the most efficient electric water heater, you know, kind of newer to the market is the heat pump water heaters, as mentioned by some of the other people too. So essentially now we are on to the fourth generation in a very short period of time of heat pump water heaters. The original heat pump water heaters, people complained about noise, right? If you've had electric water heater your whole life and you put in a, a heat pump water heater, all of a sudden it's making noise. And, and they, I don't want to say they were loud, because if you've ever had a gas power vent water heater in your house, they're quieter than a gas power vent. But again, the electric water heater that was in the house didn't make any noise to the homeowner. Now you put a heat pump in there that has a fan and it makes noise. Now we're to the fourth generation and we're down to 49 decibels, which is just as quiet or quieter than all the new modern refrigerators. The big, other big advantage with the new ones are obviously Wi-Fi connectivity. So people can get health, health alerts and kind of tells you how the heater's doing. There's leak detection on these now. Um, and the big thing that we came up with in this fourth generation is being able to duct it, which was a problem in, you know, in, our, in our area in the Midwest with basements. We're putting these in basements, and now we're taking heat out of the air in the basement, whether it was conditioned or unconditioned, and cooling that. And the people that had heat pumps originally, probably about a 10-foot radius around that, you could tell, five, six, seven degrees cooler than the rest of the room. Well, now by being able to duct it, so we can, we can duct that cool air away, outside, away from the house or to some other part of the house that you might want that cooling. Uh, what a lot of guys are doing, and they also dehumidify basements too. You don't need a dehumidifier anymore. That's another advantage of the heat pumps for us in the Midwest. So that, that is kind of the key things, being able to duct it away or in a ranch or something like that, being able to take the hot humid air out of the attic and use that for the intake air instead of drawing it from the room also. It's just air, so it's not combustion. You just use dry or duct. It's not that big of a deal. And you can do it either way. You can draw, you can draw air in and, and exhaust it in the room. You can draw air from the room and exhaust it out, or you can do both ways. So we got another, there's another video here on a heat pump. And I think this is probably the best video I've ever seen explaining how this heater works. Introducing the new Reed Hybrid Electric Water Heater. With an energy factor of 3.5, this is the smartest and most efficient water heater on the market today. It saves homeowners an estimated $4,000 in operating costs. It's also packed with smart features like leak detection, which could prevent more than $4,000 in costly water damage repairs. And it's the quietest hybrid on the market at 49 decibels. Plus, our newest hybrid design is EcoNet enabled, providing Wi-Fi connected control both at home and away. Here's how it works. A fan pulls air through the upper enclosure of the heat pump. The air passes through a filter to remove any debris or dust. Heat in the air is absorbed by eco-friendly refrigerant inside the evaporator coil, and cool, dehumidified air is exhausted. Refrigerant is pumped by a compressor through the refrigerant system. The compressor increases the temperature of the refrigerant, which is delivered to the condenser. The condenser tubing is wrapped around the water heater tank, where heat is transferred from the refrigerant to the water. All functions are controlled simultaneously by an advanced control. In energy saver mode, the heat pump and electric heat operation is utilized to optimize efficiency based on hot water use. In high demand mode, the heat pump and electric heat operation is utilized to optimize hot water delivery. In electric mode, the heat pump is disabled and the appliance operates like a standard electric water heater. In heat pump mode, the water is exhausted exclusively by the heat pump operation. In vacation mode, the water heater maintains 65 degree water for up to 28 days. The condensate drain connection routes the condensation created during the water heating process away from the unit. The built-in condensate management system will shut down the compressor if it senses water outside. This helps prevent damage and will send an alert if the condensate drain needs to be cleaned. A water sensor cable is also included. If water is detected in the drain pan, the unit emits an audible alarm and sends an alert to the homeowner's phone through the Econet app, avoiding a potentially costly leak. The electric elements are accessible on the front of the unit in an upper and lower location. The Green Hybrid Electric Water Heater installs as easily as a standard electric water heater. It also provides more hot water than most electric units and delivers it faster. Green's new hybrid electric water heaters 
savings, peace of mind, and convenience from the start. So that, that, that's essentially what we're talking about now. And so for the contractors, you know, I know we've had a lot of contractors that, that ah, it's a heat pump, I don't work on heat pumps, that kind of thing. You never have, it's a water heater. The only thing you ever change is the elements in the thermostats. And we're talking about versus um, energy savings and things like that. So versus standard electric water heater, essentially this heater pays for itself in about a year and a half. The extra cost is paid for, and, and you can obviously continue to save it over the life of the unit. You start looking at yellow energy guides on the heaters and things like that. A standard electric 50 gallon is about $555 a year now to run for an average family. This is about $180. It's that low. 3.7, so for every dollar of energy you put in, you get $3.70 back. It, it, it's really, we need, to, we need to put more of them in. I, it, we're getting there, I guess, in the Midwest. And really what's been driving these in most of the markets is, um, is, is rebates. And Diana's going to talk at the end, and she, I'll, let her, I'll let her tell you what that rebate's going to be after the first year in this area. But we start giving more, we start getting a four or $500 rebates, all of a sudden it's something to look at. When they were $150 and $200, a lot of homeowners didn't want, because obviously this is going to be a, a two or $3,000 install versus something that's eight or $900, a standard electric heater. But like, again, that difference, it pays for itself. So that, that's pretty much all I had. Get you back on track that way. All right, and we're, we're going to be here. So if you want to ask any questions about the heat pump, we left the binders there. That information is yeah. in there too. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, thanks for uh, coming. Thanks Brett for having us. Uh, my name is Phil Lamancusa from Noir Brothers Home Store. Uh, we're your local supplier for electric energy efficient appliances. Uh, literally only about a mile and a half from here, about three blocks east of John Ball Zoo. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Blake Thomas from GE Appliances to talk to you about the ultimate in stovetop cooking, uh, electric conduct and induction. Hi, as Phil just said, uh, Blake Thomas, GE Appliances. Uh, thank you all for coming out. I wasn't sure what to expect, but uh, have it at a brewery and people will come, so it makes some sense. <laughs> so uh, who here enjoys to cook? Can I get a show of hands here? Okay, some in the audience. Who here likes to eat? Test never fails. A lot more people enjoy eating. Um, so I wanna kinda go over what benefits induction provides and how it can be more efficient with not only your time, um, but also as the product is more efficient overall. Um, should we go back to the other one? All right, so as they're uh, working through some of these uh, technical difficulties here, um, I do want to point out I did bring a single induction burner so that we can kind of show off how it ac actually works, um, talk about some of the benefits, and... Uh, not really the best setting with everyone in the room, but come up afterwards and we can kind of do a little bit more one-on-one -on -one setting here. Um, so market insight. So induction isn't a new technology. It's been around for a while, but it's now starting to grow more rapidly uh, in the industry. Um, it's taken over a lot more gas cook, uh, cooking products, uh, taken over more standard electric. Um, and the reason behind that is the cost has been able to go down. And as people have had it, They've decided that, hey, we can't live without this. This is something that we need to have because of some of the benefits. Um, don't take it from me. Um, take it from some of our online reviews. So um, here's one in particular that talks about uh, the benefit that she enjoys, which is the response time um, and how uh, fast that it can bring water to a boil um, as one of the benefits. If you can cook on it faster, that gives you more time to eat and do the things that you enjoy. You don't have to spend as much time slaving over the stove. Um, this is just one example, but there are many, many more online. So um, don't take it from us. Get online, check them out. Um, so the three main benefits, heat responsiveness and efficiency. So with induction, um, it's actually not the uh, actual surface that heats up, it's the pan. Um, which will help with that efficiency because you're not losing heat 
So if you're cooking on a gas stove, um, the middle's gonna have a lot, retain a lot more of that heat, but you're gonna have heat loss out the sides. Um, same with an electric, uh, standard electric cooktop. If uh, you're cooking on that and you're cooking on a smaller pan on a larger element, you're losing all that heat because it's coming out the sides. Um, ease of cleaning. Um, if you have anyone who has a gas stove uh, is familiar with how dirty and how hard it is to clean, again, just a time-saving thing, so the efficiency from that standpoint. A lot easier to clean, just wipe it clean. Um, you, can, um, you can turn off all the, the buttons on the actual panel, just wipe it clean, um, don't have to worry about any issues. And, uh, <laughs> but we do have issues with some of the technology here in the room. And the, another thing is safety with it. Um, right now, we actually have a pot boiling, bo uh, boiling on here, and I can actually touch the surface, and it's cool to, ah, no, nah, I'm just kidding. It's uh, cool to the touch. So, um, so anyone who has kids, if you want to help educate them on how to cook, uh, it's a, a lot safer of a product to use. So... Well, how much water are we talking about? This I poured in. I poured in. Mm -hmm. So I, I poured in uh, 16 ounces. So half a quart here, and it took a minute and 10 seconds to bring to a boil. What did you set it at? I put it on the max. So um, that's one of the other things with uh, induction is uh, the responsiveness of it. Right now, we got it fully boiling. We turn it all the way off or down, and it's already stopped. Um, so um, when, you, when you are cooking on it, um, being able to control that heat a little bit better was gonna provide a better, better meal, just gives you more control. A lot of people are scared to go to induction from if they're in love with their gas stove because they feel like they have more control with gas, when in all actuality, you're gonna get a lot more benefit out of induction. Um, so as you can kind of see this diagram here, it kind of talks about the boiling time and some of the differences um, between the two, all three different cooking methods. Um, means of efficiency. Um, again, just it talks about more of the heat loss, the energy loss when cooking in gas compared to induction, and induction is by far, far you're going to retain more of that heat and that energy, 84% compared to a gas uh, power boil element, 38% of the heat is going into the pot and the rest is being lost. So um, huge, huge gains and benefits there. Um, so how does it work? Um, does anyone have induction in their home? No. Great. Uh, all right. And I do. So we, we're the perfect people to talk about this and the benefits because um, we actually have it and use it on a regular basis in our own homes. Um, the question is, how does it work? How can I actually touch this element that's boiling this pot of water right next to it and I not get burnt? Um, so it's, it's magic. It's just, who knows? It's science. <laughs> Uh, but in all actuality, it's an uh, electromagnetic uh, field. When you turn on this element, it cues the coils that, that it's ready. So if, if we take this pot off, again, I can touch it, won't be hurt. But as soon as we put this pot on, it has an iron content in it. Uh, the pot, it has to be a special pot that would hold a magnet. Um, and when you put that pot on that surface, it would signify to it um, a reaction. And it's actually the pot that gets hot, not the actual surface. Um, and so when, again, that's, I guess, how it works. The electromagnetic field signifies to the pot that the molecules will then um, vibrate, uh, causes this friction and this reaction for the pot to actually get hot and not the actual surface. How close to the nonstick pan? Uh, very well. So um, the, one of the other things with buying induction is, oh, now I have to get all new pots and pans because they won't work with this new induction. Easy way to test is with the magnet. Well, if not, we... Uh, GE has a, a specific model that actually has a rebate where if you buy the, the slide-in oven, you get a free 11-piece cookware set that will work with the induction. Um, the other thing when you're purchasing special cookware with it, um, for, that, for the best reaction to happen and like to reduce noise level, because there will be somewhat of a rattling if the, if the cookware is not flat, is you want to get the flattest cookware as possible so it's an even, clean, flat surface that it's on. Um, but I have non-stick cook, it comes with non-stick cookware and it does very well, no problems at all. Um, here's a video, if we're able to start this or will this cause? Can you narrate it? Oh, <laughs> it's basically, it's a lot of regurgitation of what I've said, so if we don't want to mess with the volume. Yeah. 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 
uh, how does induction work? Uh, Again, it's a lot. It's a lot of the repeat of kind of what I just said about how it creates an electromagnetic field. You put the pot on; it's going to cause a little bit more rapid boil compared to other heating elements. Pots and pans have to hold a magnet. Yeah, no, no ouch, no ouchies, and the butter test there. So again, there's a lot of good t content online, um, a lot of good videos of people doing demonstrations and such. Um, on YouTube, so. What is the minimum of your um, energy output on those burners? Is that as, I mean, is it, are you using you know, 1,500 watts, uh, 1,800 watts? I mean, is there a... That is a great question. Um, I will find an answer for you and come back to you, but I don't know off the top of my head. When I, when I put it at, like, the lowest output, I'm not sure what the... Would I just hit the next button, or is it... That 30, yeah, I don't know what the lowest setting. Yeah. What about canning? We do a lot of canning out in the country. You know, we got two or three to five gallon cannons on it. Will they work on an induction or is that a Phil, problem? have you had a lot of problems with that or is that? No, it just the pan has to have iron in it. So the pan has to have iron. As long as the pan will hold a magnet, it'll work. A lot of the induction uh, burners are huge 12 inch burners. So you'd want one with a large 12 inch burner and the pan just has to have iron in it. The iron rea reacts to the electromagnetic field. Yeah, so all aluminum, all copper pans will not work. Go ahead. It's, I think it's over like 94% of the, um, you know, of the power get, goes into the pot. Yeah, it's very, very little loss compared to gas is like 30, 40% and regular electric is like 50 or 60%. So it's over 90% of the energy is transferred into the pan. And it's gonna cook, it's gonna cook faster, so that's gonna be less time that the unit's on as well, which also is an energy savings there and a time savings. So. Um, Induction offering, so every kitchen's kind of made differently, whether you have built-in products, freestanding products. Um, so I just kind of wanted to highlight and show we have different offerings, whether you just have a actual built-in type cooktop and a 30-inch 30, 30 platform or a 36-inch platform, um, whether you have more of a traditional freestanding uh, stove or a slide-in stove where it's front control, um, you can get induction in all the different product offerings uh, and a magnitude of colors finishes as well. Um, one of the newest things I wanted to highlight and what this burn, so this burner is created by a company called Heston Q and we've recently partnered with them to, uh, to create and provide this kind of, uh, induction 2.0, um, cause current induction, it's not like you control the precise temperature, but once you select that level five, it's going to stay at that, that level. Um, with Heston Q, we've, uh, rolled this out on our cafe. Uh, slide in and uh, cooktops. It's uh, you download the Heston Q app um, on the app, and I can demonstrate this kind of one on one at the end here. Um, you got to have a, it comes with a special pan with it as well, and it's a smart pan. Um, you download the Heston Q app. Uh, it, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty crazy and a little bit over the top here, but you download that app. They have an assortment of recipes. Um, the demonstration I've seen is crepes. I wouldn't have the slightest idea on how to how to prepare or cook a crepe. Um, but with this technology and with this app, it'll do a step-by-step -step how to prepare and cook this crepe. And um, I wouldn't know what level of temperature, but it would say it needs to be at 300 degrees or whatever it is. And you can use the app to actually turn on your element, and it would set it at that precise level and like take you step-by-step -step on, oh, it needs to sit there for three minutes at this level. It needs to be sitting here at this level for this long. You can and set the pan to an exact degree and it'll hold that temp. Like if you want 180 degree pan, it will just hold that exact temp on your pan. Um, so pancake or crepe. Or yep, bag. so it's gourmet guided. Um, so there's that and then there's also uh, sous vide. Has anyone ever heard of sous vide cooking? So some, you have that little probe you'd stick in the water to get that exact temperature. Induction, you can use induction cooktops the same way. Um, some of our models come with that probe um, that would allow you to cook that perfect steak where it's medium rare evenly throughout. So um, with that, I think I've uh, reached my conclusion here. So I want to thank everyone. And uh, I guess I got a question I got to ask. Uh, $5 gift card, you have that, Brett?
All right, where should you buy your GE appliances here locally? Nawara, <laughs> give them the gift card. So yeah, I mean, induct, induction. I own induction now. I've owned all the cooking. I've owned electric, uh, coil, glass, gas, and induction is truly the ultimate. It's the easiest to cook on. It boils twice as fast. It's the easiest to clean because the area where your pans are on doesn't get hot. So if you have a boil over or spill, that doesn't burn onto your cookware. It just easily wipes up. Um, so it is truly the ultimate uh, cooktop. There was a uh, sound, you probably all couldn't hear, but it was kind of emitting a little bit of a sound. Is that normal for all it does. It does make a sound when it's on, yes. Yep. And it does have a little bit of a hum. It's that kind of reaction of the magnetized. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a little bit different because it is a single burner. You have it on a larger platform. Yeah, the, I have induction you know, range, and it's not near as loud as that at home. Um, also wanted me to talk a little bit about heat pump dryers. So that's something that's kind of coming out. So they've had condensation dryers for a while, which utilize heat pump. Like you guys have been talking about heat pumps and water heaters and, and uh, you know, geothermal and everything. Now, uh, starting next year, there are going to be more and more electric heat pump dryers available where they're using the ambient you know, air temperature to heat way more efficient than gas in the past. People always prefer natural gas dryers in the in the urban area just because they're so more much more efficient than electric. But with the heat pump dryers, they're like twice as efficient as a gas dryer, so they are becoming available. Um, LG is offering uh, a few models coming in 2019 that are actually vented heat pump dryers, not condensation dryers. So that's another uh, advantage. And you have condensing too, right? Just we sell condensing dryers also. So uh, Bosch makes we sell a ton of the Bosch condensation dryer. And, you have an application where you can't vent it, and so you want to do ventless. Um, Bosch does condensation. Uh, uh, GE does condensation uh, dryers. We have some other brands, so definitely come see us. Any questions? How's the cost compare? Induction flat stop versus your regular? So induction is slightly more, but in the recent years, it's come down a lot. I mean, induction has been out for a long time, and you know, 10 years ago, it was you know three thousand dollars for an induction cooktop or now you can get a whole induction convection range for you know less than two thousand dollars cooktops are fifteen hundred dollars roughly so they've come down quite a bit all right all right thanks so much i think i fixed it which one's the select? This, this one, right? yeah. Okay, let's just double test it. All right. Good evening, everybody. I'm here to wrap up our green beer series here. Um, real briefly about myself, I am the residential trade ally representative for the Energy Optimization Collaborative. We serve rural electric cooperatives, and we offer a rebate program for residential retrofits uh, on HVAC and new home construction. Um, everybody has a rebate chart. Um, if you serve the city of South Haven, just kind of scratch that off. The rebates for South Haven are not the same as on that rebate chart. So I don't want any of the Bauman and DeGroote folks in the back to get in trouble with their city of South Haven customers by uh, talking about a $200 ECM motor rebate when it's only $100 out there. But in this greater area, you will run into rural electric cooperatives. Um, we've got Great Lakes Energy just surrounding this greater area, Midwest Energy and Communications down by Kalamazoo, and Homeworks Tri-County right over by Lansing. So I'm going to talk to you about the benefits of taking your existing home all electric if you might be on natural gas or propane. And what gives me uh, the background to be able to tell you about this? Well, 62% of the members that participate in our rebate program and our energy optimization program do not have access to natural gas. They heat with fuels like propane and that means that they are always looking for another alternative because delivered fuels can be a bit tricky um, depending on the time of the year, depending on how things go in Iowa with the corn harvest, that can really affect our propane availability and fuel prices here in the winter. So I've worked with a number of members across the state, even up in Cloverland, over in Sault Ste. Marie, who are operating their homes on heat pumps, saving energy and improving their comfort. So we're going to go through the steps to electrify your existing home today. 
The reason I bring up Wolverine Power Cooperative and the utilities that I work for is because they have been rapidly transitioning from coal-based fuel to wind, solar, hydroelectric, and other green fuel types. Now, transitioning to an all-electric home, we want it to be beneficial. And so for it to be beneficial, we need to make sure that our electric sources are well efficient and green, not necessarily coming from coal. So in a five-year period, Wolverine Power, who provides the power to all of the seven rural electric co-ops down here in Michigan, transitioned from 5% wind and solar in 2012. Five years later, they're over 20% wind and solar, 56% total carbon-free energy, and that's because they also have a lot of hydroelectric power. So a lot of technological change is why we're able to look at electrifying our homes that are heated with natural gas or propane right now. Wind and solar are some of those biggest reasons, but also the availability and the increased performance of heat pump products, both air source and ground source, as well as heat pump water heaters. So let's just really quickly recap what beneficial electrification is here now that we're at the end. So from the big picture perspective, beneficial electrification is electrifying sources that were normally powered by fossil fuels to get to deep carbon savings. Okay, so now we know what that means in terms of being green and being efficient, but what does it mean to a homeowner who's maybe just looking to save money in the long run, reduce their environmental impact, and enable better grid management? We can do those in a very quick stepped approach, trying to save a homeowner money in the long run. The first thing we're going to do, rather than just add an air source heat pump and replace our natural gas furnace, first we need to look at our thermal envelope. We need to make sure that we've take, looked at our existing home, we've run a blower door test, we've done some thermal imaging, and we've checked to make sure that we've got appropriate levels of insulation in the attic walls, we've insulated our rim joists, and we've done as much air sealing as we can. Once we've done that, then we can move towards electrifying our heating. So from a big picture standpoint, when we make improvements to our home, those will generally last at a minimum of 10 years, but they can last as long as 25 to 30 years. So we need to be thinking about the future of our electric generation as we make changes to our home. So we've all struggled through the shift from incandescent to, to CFLs. It was hard to find the right color temperature, hard to find the right lighting output, and hard to find CFLs that dimmed properly. But we've managed to make it through and now we're on to LEDs and I think we're all pretty happy with their performance. But so there's two items on this list that I'm gonna talk about real briefly before we go into it that aren't on here. We've got lighting, we've got water heating, we've got space heating. Uh, can anybody think, and I'll give you a clue, what I'm gonna talk about on here that is not on this slide. It should be the only combustion appliance in your home that's unvented. Does anybody know what that appliance is? Nope, it's not the cooktop, close. I, I heard it. Oven. Yes, it's the oven. <laughs> it was a pretender. <laughs> well, good work. <laughs> I guess that drink goes to me afterwards. <laughs> no, no. So when we're talking about a, a gas-fired oven, um, I'm a BPI certified building analyst. I've tested over 300 homes in my career. And about one out of 10 homes I go into has a health and safety issue. And a lot of times it's the oven. Does anybody know real briefly you know, about how much carbon monoxide your oven can give off before a BPI certified home inspector has to shut it down? Actually, it's been reduced to 225. <laughs> but so that's a lot of carbon monoxide that could be going across and going through your home. So that's why when we talk about cooking, we've got options like induction. Um, that, that's really great. 
Um, we replace a cooktop or a range, depending on the fuel type, every 13 to 17 years. And I'll tell you this, I've, I've cooked on electric my whole life. And I'm pretty excited to go to induction because scrubbing my ceramic cooktop after Thanksgiving is not very fun. <laughs> All right, so we, we've handled switching out our lighting. We've talked about switching out our, our uh, cooking equipment. Next thing we get to is water heating. Water heaters are replaced every 10 to 15 years. Um, that is the number two health and safety issue I find is a backdrafting, atmospherically vented water heater. Not many of us think about our water heater when you know, we're thinking about our home. We, we think about our finishes, we think about our appliances, but we don't really give a lot of time to our HVAC systems and our water heating systems. And so by going to a hybrid heat pump water heater, uh, we, we help ourselves out in the health and safety department because we can eliminate a gas line that could have a potential leak and we eliminate a source of carbon monoxide uh, in our home. And, and those three items, those are, in my opinion, the most economical to change out. There's one more, we talk about light duty vehicles here. Um, by 2039, it's expected that half of all vehicles on the road are going to be electric. So in my opinion, I think the, the first thing we can do to make our home electric and appealing to maybe a, another buyer later on down the road is to simply add a level two charger to the garage. It's simply a 220 volt outlet. That's a pretty easy improvement and that gets us on the step to electrifying our vehicle as well. So space heating. Again, we've got to follow that principle of tightening our envelope and insulating first because we're not going to do anybody a service if we just take out our gas or propane heating equipment and replace it with electric. It's really not going to work. We need to make sure we have a lower heating need in our home before we go to that heat pump. But how do we do that cost effectively? One of the things is we're not going to necessarily do all of these things at once. We're going to stage them. So the first thing I'm doing, and I'm, I'm taking my 1900s built farmhouse in Belleville, Michigan, all electric. But I'm starting to do that with the help of my gas provider. Because I use natural gas right now to heat my home. I've insulated first. And I'm, I'm going to wait until I need to replace my furnace or I need to replace my air conditioner. So that allows me to take advantage of gas rebates for insulation right now. So I get paid a little bit back for the fact that I'm saving and providing environmental benefits right now just by insulating. All right, so that's the big picture in heating our homes. And as we can see that just a residential building and you go about 35 years before we make any major changes to it. If that, I mean, my home was built in 1900s, and I just put insulation in it when I bought it in 2011. <laughs> so it went a lot longer than that. Um, we did talk a lot about air source heat pumps and how heat pumps can be beneficial. Um, and so one of the, the um, couples I've worked with uh, across uh, my career has been Jim and Ann Stump. They're a, a wonderful couple in Lyons, Michigan, not too far from here. And this year they um, were lucky enough to win the Governor's Energy Excellence Award for Best Residential Project. Um, they have a farmhouse built in about 1880. Um, this home was built prior to electricity. Um, Jim right there, uh, he saw this home um, through, it, through, through his lifetime. He's experienced a coal-fired furnace, an oil-fired furnace, a high-efficiency propane-fired furnace in it, and he went to geothermal. In the first year of operation, um, because they replaced a 10-seer air conditioner along with their propane-based furnace. They saved 3,264 kilowatt hours just by changing that air conditioner out to their ground source heat pump. They cut their total carbon footprint on their home by 80% by getting rid of 
that high efficiency propane fired furnace and switching it out with geothermal. Now, the reason Jim and Ann made this change to their home was because they went through the propane price spike, I believe, was it 2014? Where it hit $4 a gallon. Ann is a retired school teacher. Jim is a farmer. They live on a fixed income. Jim would also like to retire. And to be able to do this, they needed to know that what they pay to heat and cool their home would be affordable and would be predictable. And unfortunately, on propane, you can't necessarily predict what your fuel price is going to be because it can vary. So I just wanted to point out that um, you don't have to necessarily use an, elect, uh, an air source heat pump. You can use geothermal and see the benefits. And these are great in homes with much higher heating needs. In, in new homes, we have a building code that's pushing us towards a tight envelope and high R values for our insulation. We don't have that in older homes. So unfortunately, when those loads are higher, mini splits may not be the most economical approach, but a geothermal heat pump can be. So just keep that in mind. The upfront cost may be a little bit higher, but it's certainly worth it. Jim and Ann saved for about four years and were able to buy their system cash. So again, the benefits of electrification are to save money, reduce your exposure to fuel price volatility, lower your environmental impact, and provide enhanced convenience. And we get a lot of enhanced convenience by upgrading our HVAC systems right now. I've got a smartphone in my pocket. It allows me to control my furnace right now. I could turn it down and make my husband really cold while I'm 250 miles away from him. And I've also got the ability to control my propane fired furnace in my cabin up north. And man, thank God I have that because at least I know when my propane tank might be going low. All right, so again, the electrification benefits. Space heating is our biggest use of fuel, followed by water heating. And only about 1% of the pie up there is air conditioning. If I'm paying $3,000 for an air conditioner, I would really like to use it more than two months out of the year. But that can happen if I insulate my home, which I'm doing. I've done the attic, I've done the rim joist, I've done all that what we call low-hanging fruit, and now I've got to get into the nitty-gritty meat of it. I've got to take my siding off and blow insulation into the second floor walls because unfortunately the contractor that insulated my house before I bought it didn't know my walls were balloon frame, so now I only have insulation on the first floor. <laughs> so once, once I do that, then I'm actually gonna switch my furnace and air conditioner out with a central air source heat pump. And I'm gonna be able to use that outdoor unit a lot more than two, time, two, you know, two months out of the year. So again, we just when we're talking about electrification, we do need to think about how clean our current power source is. So where I live right now, it's actually 60% coal, unfortunately for, unfortunately for me, because I really want to move on this electrification route, but I do want to be beneficial to our environment. So I'm going to follow the staged approach. I'm going to insulate, save on natural gas right now, and then when our grid is a little bit greener, then I'm going to go all electric. But I want to do it in stages to make sure that I am keeping pace with the improvements that our electric utilities are making. Because again, if we just switch from natural gas, which can be very high and efficient right now, to all electric when it's being generated by coal, I'm not really being carbon beneficial, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, check, uh, no matter who your electric provider is, I'm pretty confident that you can go to their website and on their website you will find what their current fuel mixes are. Um, and as I said, I am with the uh, Rural Electric Cooperatives in this greater area, and we offer incentives. Um, just so you know, on mini split heat pumps, $750, whether that be new construction, existing construction, ground source heat pumps, $500, ECM motors, $200, heat pump water heaters, $300 when replacing an existing electric water heater. Um, that's actually some of our members save about $40 a month when they've switched their electric resistance over to the heat pump water heaters. 
I know there's a lot of talk here and there when I talk with distributors and contractors that they're concerned about heat pump water heaters causing discomfort in basements. I surveyed all of the members in our cooperative that put in heat pump water heaters and not one of them told me that that was an issue. The only issue that was told to me about a heat pump water heater is the only thing I have to do is when all my family comes over for the holidays and they're staying with me, sometimes I have to switch over to electric resistance just to make sure I have that demand, but that's only a few days out of the year. If that's only a few days out of the year, that's really not sacrificing much in terms of efficiency. So thank you all so much for your time, and I think that gets us into the question and answer session. Yeah, we got some time for Q&A, so if everybody who was speaking wants to come up, and we got a mic back there so we can kind of capture your, your questions. Um, so, and we'll just hand it off after that. So anybody? Does anyone even remember what I talked about? Two hours? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've got a question. So for the induction stove tops, what's going on in the um, oven? Is it just heat resistance? Uh, if you get an induction range, just the cooktop is induction. So the, the oven is a standard electric you know, oven or convection oven. Is there a way that you can uh, switch out a boiler system with a geothermal heating system? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's case by case because a lot of it just depends on how the boiler was installed, what you're spacing, how old it was. Um, basically, when you're doing that, you're getting into one of two things, either complete replacement, meaning with a buffer tank and everything, or there are some high temperature geothermal units out there. But can it be done? Yes. It's just case by case. Okay, here's the question is, what does our system cost in a 1,500 square foot house? Uh, the answer is, it depends. It really does. It, it, you know, because there's so many options with geothermal, and I'm assuming it, there's so many options with air source, is, you know, what do you want it to do? Um, so, and how well is it? So really, here's, here's the answer I'm gonna give. Anyone who would give you that answer real quick, um, you probably want to steer clear of because it, it requires a heat load. This is something where they're coming in. Yeah. That would probably be on the high side. So if you have that in your mind, you're ready. Yeah. Yeah, you might be so, surprised. Yeah. Actually. Yeah, you probably would be. Exact, exact same answer. I get that multiple times. I get it. I get it a lot too. Where I'll get a plan sent to me, and they'll be like, "Here's a house laid out with Mitsubishi." Well, you saw all the different indoor units we have, and do you want to look at the first or the sixtieth scenario that I can lay out for you? It literally, really, it it hundred percent depends. The heat load drives everything. So, it's unfortunately, it's not an easy answer. I'm just going to back these guys up and tell you that it really does depend. None of us want to throw out a bulk park figure because we want to make sure you're happy with the system that goes in your home and that requires individualized assessments and consultations, especially with Mitsubishi systems. All of those different indoor heads or wall mount, floor mount, we really got to understand what your preferences are to make sure that you're going to be happy with the system in the long run. So, if you have an existing home or a planned home that's coming up, the best thing to do is energy modeling, whether it's through the HERS index rating or the home energy score. And so what that's going to do is measure up the home, tell you how much energy it's going to use, and then you can swap the systems out with your assessor, with your rater, and come up with a plan, uh, and then ideally talk about whether it even makes sense if it's going to heat, you know, and do a heat load calc uh, to make sure it's going to properly heat uh, the home. So. You all, the rest of you all, good, know the answers? <laughs> the uh, green uh, water heater 
you were saying the ROI and that was uh, 18 months. Is that compared to what electric? Or? Yeah, so versus okay. standard 50 gallon electric to a 50 gallon heat pump, the cost difference and the install difference. You know, the homeowner will see that payback. And, and Diana's point, that's probably pretty accurate, about $40 a month savings. Okay, great. Versus standard electric water heater. And then you start talking about, obviously, it costs more money up front. Um, we've been doing a lot more because of the more expensive water heaters. Water heaters have gotten a lot more expensive with these energy codes and the new heaters have come out where you talk about financing that for a homeowner. And we offer some financing uh, programs too. And now with a heat pump water heater, they're, you know, they might be paying $32 a month and they're saving 40. Right. You know, it, you really, you know, until the finance over then, then, then you're really saving too. I, right. I was going to say it probably fits right in with that stuff, too. Okay, great. Thank you. So, yeah, well, while you, we were talking about that, what's the, compared to natural gas in an urban area, a heat pump? Is, an, is a heat pump a water heater more efficient than natural gas? And then if so, what's the ROI on that? Yeah, it, it, it's real close. So when you look at those energy guides, now that we're uh, – the electric wa standard electric water heater was probably three or four times as much as a standard 40-gallon gas heater. The energy guides now are real close. They're right around $200 a year, somewhere in that range. I'm trying to prepare myself. I think it's 121 on your heat pump water heater. I think it was like 220 on the natural. Yeah, so that, you know, depending on how much hot water you use and the temperature you have it set at and those kinds of things, the same kind of thing you guys are saying. But it's going to be it's going to be pretty close. Does it have a Water heater, does it uh, change, does it heat faster? I mean, can you adjust how fast it is? Yeah, so there's five different modes that it talked about. Right, right. So you could put, and I, and I would say in our, so you know, in, in Michigan, our, yeah, in Michigan, I would leave it in energy saver mode because that's going to that's gonna let it decide. So if you have a big draw, you fill the tub up or something like that, the elements and the heat pump will both come out at the same time to reheat that water. You know, and, and if we only use... We ran a sink and we ran 10 or 12 gallons out of it. Th then the heat pump's going to take its time and very efficiently recover that water too. So. Forgive my ignorance in the question here, but how is these uh, hot water systems that you're describing here? How do these compare to a tankless hot water system? On the gas side, yeah, yeah that's that's really where you, okay. So tankless-wise, electric-wise in Michigan for a whole house doesn't really work because you probably need a 400 amp panel to run it enough to get what you're gonna need output-wise. Tankless gas-wise versus that heat pump water here, that's gonna be really close. A 98% a you know, uh, condensing uh, gas tankless here that, that we make too, versus, versus the heat pump, they're probably pretty close. Yeah, maybe 500. Five hundred to a thousand dollars less on a retrofit, especially because there's there's more involved with the gas tankless, with the gas pipe sizing and things like that 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 you could get into, depending on how old the house is. Just wanted to comment on the uh, heat pump water heater thing. Uh, our house is five years old. We put in a standard electric water heater. I uh, have seven children, and three months ago we switched to the heat pump water heater, and have been saving over ninety dollars a month. Uh, what we actually did was fed the existing electric water heater with the heat pump water heater, um, turning the heat pump water heater about 10 degrees higher than the set point on the second older tank. Um, so now we have 100 gallons of hot water storage. So you use it as a storage tank. I got gotcha. you. He's see, looking at go. this graph here on his phone. It's like, you know, high, 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 and then it just drops right off. <laughs> it's Um, but is there any feasibility to geothermal um, for multifamily? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, y you're talking the same thing as you would be talking in a in a individual house. You have families in those units, and so really, it's not uncommon. In fact, Courtney, who was here earlier. Um, they they do a lot of projects that are either multifamily or commercial oriented um, because no matter what,
those loops, you know, when when it's 100 degrees, well, okay, we're in Michigan. When it's 95 degrees uh, in the summer, you know, eight foot down, it doesn't know that. When it's negative 10 in the winter, eight foot down, it doesn't know that. So regardless of the structure that it's in, it's definitely going to perform more efficiently. So, yeah, absolutely. Good question. <laughs> Answer something? I think this is a question for, for you. Oh, okay. um, I'm curious if uh, Michigan law allows for, and this would be maybe new construction, if there's people developing plots of houses, could you, could you set up a, a net zero family of houses or a multifamily with uh, its own mini grid? That's um, actually probably not the best question for me. Um, I don't do deal too much with you know the rulemaking or anything like that. I just follow the Michigan Energy Measures database. Is anybody from the Michigan Agency for Energy still here? <laughs> All right. Um, so I can say that I I'm pretty confident something like that is happening in Ann Arbor. Um, but what I do know is it takes time to go through that permitting and, and, and policy development. Um, so I think it can be done, um, but it's going to take you some time. We're working with a company out of Novi, too, called Trinergy. It's a microgrid community or community idea. So get in touch with us, and we'll, we are looking into that. So. Thank you. I was wondering if you're ever going to have, uh, in these future things, are you going to bring anybody in that about and different types. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, uh, we do have to we do have to wrap up. So real quick, I, I will answer your question, but I want to thank all of our speakers here today. Um, thank all of our supporters. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Some of you donated, so I really appreciate all of that. Uh, thank the Michigan uh, Agency for Energy and Founders. And uh, yeah, so a survey should be hitting your inboxes in about 15 minutes. And so we want to hear from you on, uh, on what you want to see uh, in these next coming that we're going to be doing and we're going to try to do more of these. So we do want to do a thermal envelope one, an air seal insulation one. Uh, we want to get T-Stud back out. It has some information over there. And Buzz is sitting right there, too. So yeah, it's a great point. But yeah, we're going to be doing more sessions, hopefully the end of February. We're going to be back here talking about net zero energy, which is going to encompass uh, HVAC, thermal envelopes, solar and all of that. So we'll be back here then. We'll send you some more information on that. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for coming out. If you want to keep chatting, keep talking, uh, maybe some of you guys can head downstairs, and they're still open. So. And I valet park taxi at the party continues till 2 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> you a lot. So.